know this till today. They're not too sure of it yet, but <laughs> in 1955, let's see, London was the man came up. I called him and he didn't even have an automobile. Do you remember that London? Sure do. Check it, check it. I guess you do, you're walking. <laughs> And he didn't even have an automobile, and I, I heard him three years prior to that in Fort Payne, Alabama. He was out with Shorty and myself. You know, back then there wasn't any dressing room. This was in 19, about 52 or three long in there. Wasn't any dressing rooms, and Shorty and myself had a four-door car. I won't say it's a Cadillac, but it's a car. Anyway, we would go down in right field in these ballparks, and we'd open all the doors. And you can dress between those doors out there. People can see your legs, but that is all. So that's <laughs> he was standing, he came down there. He said, I've always enjoyed hearing you two sing, the happy two, Shorty Bradford and Leroy Alabama. Man, you're just, just getting to meet you, something. So he says, uh, <coughs> <laughs> uh I said, who do you sing with? I never have sung. I, I don't sing with nobody. I'm just here. I, I'm, I'm in the middle corps. Medic, medic, wasn't it? Air Force. Air Force. Well, I knew you was all up high that day, and you just dropped into the bottom there all of a sudden. So, later, the Homeland Harmony Quartet had this great television program in Atlanta, the only full-time television show for seven years we were on down there, except they got in an argument I don't know, it might have been Connor Hall and Asel Sober. The tenor and the bass, yeah, that's who it would have been. <laughs> Anyhow, they, they got an argument over a used car. The prices of it, that's all. So that night, Asel Sober just pulled him in a chair and sat down back there. And I looked at 30 seconds, I said, where's Asel? Connor Hall said, oh, uh, he, he's, he's quit. Now, if you don't think that's the way with the quartet life, get in it and see it. They'll quit you and you own the air right then. Now, what he didn't know, what Asel Sword didn't know when he quit and sat down back there, that we were auditioning then for an NBC full-time show. In the next studio, they were there to hear us, and we had made all kind of arrangements. I said, pull that mic over here right quick. We just got 15 seconds, and they run me a mic over there. And I sang with them, and needless to say, we didn't get the contract. <laughs> But we'd have got it if Ace would have been there. Yeah, you would have been there. Really would have. But I called this boy. I had Shorty to call this boy. He said, how are we going to get him? He said, I didn't know his name. Do you? I said, no. He said, well, he come down at the ballpark, you know, that time? I said, yeah. He says, uh, uh, I saw him leave. I said, who did he leave with? He said, Deacon Utley and the Smile of Wild Boys. I said, get Deacon Utley on the phone. Make him join us. He got Deacon, and they was over there rehearsing, and he got out of the Army just a day or two before that. Wasn't doing nothing. Still not doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, let me tell you, he came up there, and that night we put him on television, and he sang one song with us. <coughs> Nobody said a word. The quartet wouldn't even speak to him. Now, this is the truth. They wouldn't even speak to you. You can vouch for that right there. They just looked at him. Because he didn't know the song he sang. He sang low soprano on Rock of Ages, you know that. He sung all the time, whether he had a lead or not. He sung on everybody's lead. <laughs> now, he, uh, this is all just coming up from thinking back over it, but it came about this way. I said, when I was working with London, and these other boys also got in there later in that same week, I can't tell about all of it, but each one of them. Let's see, that one on the far end, we walked in, London, myself, walked into a shoe store. He says, hey, hey, what can I do for you? I said, be at my house at 7 o'clock tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and he was there. Come walking in, you know, just like he is now. He's still full of life. Well, the next one, I believe, was a brown coat. You told me about him. Some, did you tell me about him? Who was he? You told me. He said, now, this, this, this boy here said he, he's not too good a singer. I don't know if he sings at all or not, but he's a good-looking old boy. <laughs> You all agree with that? Well, that's wonderful. And he it says, it's a good time, a good time, I think, to do this. He says, uh, let's just call him. I says, what does he do? He says, he drives a bread truck. 
on a $120,000 contract on television. I was calling this kind of help in, <laughs> right here. I said, uh, there's a boy came up here a few years ago, a few months ago, and sat over there on the couch. And he came up here with somebody else. And I could hear him better than I could hear the guy standing here uh, teaching. He sat over there and hummed, and he had a tone that projected. That's the second one right there. I haven't told you their name, so I'll tell you what it was. You'll find out if his tone projects on this next song, too. That's Philip Bramlett. Let me tell them all, and then you give them a big hand. Philip Bramlett on the right, Ed Dodson next, James Brown next, and Sarge is what his name was when I found him. Sarge. I got lots of names. Yeah, but you can't tell all of them. Anyhow, we started in the television station. He says, uh, I said, what's your name? He says, Sarge. Just call me Sarge. That's what they call me. I said, there's no Sarge's in my quartet. What's the biggest thing in the world? Paris, London. I said, that's it. That's your name. And he's been named that ever since. Don't you think that's a great name for all the boys? Now, let's give them a hand there, all of them. Now, here's a song that we just love called Beth Ellis wrote it. In memory of Beth Ellis tonight, who can't be here because he's in heaven. We're going to do heavenly love right here. Heavenly love was all that could help me. I was astray, so sad and alone. I looked above, my burdens all left me. Now I can say, heaven my home. Oh, heavenly love, my hope and Lord. Is the above, and he is my soul and shield. He made me mine, and learned to At Jordan's dark river, shadows of night are gathering above. There is a power I know will deliver. Heavenly love, heavenly love, heavenly love. Love above the sea, lifting above. I'll tell you what, I've been a lot of places and had a lot of good time, but I believe that here, with all this vast audience, and let's see, is anybody out there that came a thousand miles? Let's see your hand. Lord, yes. Look at yonder. Good gracious of life. All right, somebody come above that. How, raise your hand. Let's see where. All right, where'd you come from? Colorado. Los Angeles. Oh, you topped them all there, you partner. Chicago, did you get blown down here? <laughs> Where? So. <laughs> Listen, this, this time is, this thing is timed out here, and I don't want to take advantage of your goodwill or theirs. I think if they wanted me to play one, they would have told me. So I'm not turning you down, but I've got it on this album, this, this right here, there's 12 on it. That's what I dropped. I'm going to leave that one laying there. Somebody will get in.
Tonight, we are happy to present a gentleman who is keeping traditional Southern gospel music on the airways over the country. He is the host 